<laughs> Hi everyone. Um, I think um, it's time to start. I just want to remind everyone that when you log in, please um, remember to also mute your microphone. And so yeah, welcome everyone to the September Changing Demands webinar for the social and behavior change communication community of practice. And today our webinar topic is going to be on the pangolin trade in China. <clears throat> this webinar is the 16th in our series and we are ha very happy to welcome Yi Bu Wang, who is a PhD candidate from the University of Cambridge today. And to just um, tell you a little bit about um, Yi Bu's background, Yi Bu started PhD in 2015 and her research focuses on markets and trade in China. Her field work has included research on Hainan Island use of pangolin scales and meat for emotional and functional motivation um, using social science techniques. And today Yifu will be talking about her research and touch on uh, the pangolin trade participant program as well as some of the conservation actions that have been just um, sorry about that. She will also be um, talking about the consumption of um, pangolin meat and, and pots as pertain to traditional Chinese medicine of TCM. So as with the usual format, we'll be starting off with a presentation for the first um, maybe half an hour or 40 minutes and then um, we'll hand this over to my colleague Gail Burgess to share the, the Q&A or discussion session afterwards. So uh, if you have any questions at all, or if you want to share your insights, please, you can use um, the chat function, which you can probably be able to see on your screen right now, or feel free to text me at any moment at all if you, when we move forward and if you have any trouble at all. So yes, um, yeah, I think um, let's get started and we are ready when you are, Yifu. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction too. Um, can you can you hear me? Is, is it working well? Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you yep. very well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. So. Um. Okay. I will get started. Um. Uh, as you said, uh, this talk is going to be focusing on pangolin trade and it's mainly in China. Uh, what has been done and what maybe some suggestion on what should be done. Uh, so the structure of the talk today is going. Uh, mm, okay, my computer. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So the structure of the talk today is going to be as uh, following. Firstly, a little bit background on pangolin and pangolin trade to make sure we're on the same page, and then uh, I'll go over the. Briefly go over the pangolin trade in China, divided into mainly three parts: the hunters, the traders, the sellers, and the consumers. And I will talk in a bit more detail about the traditional Chinese medicine market and its uh, relation with the pangolin trade. And finally, the conclusions and uh, some recommendations on uh, maybe what could be done in future. So, started uh, pangolin. Uh, it's the only mammal group that has scales covering the body, so it makes them very unique. And they are also called scaly anteaters because they feed mainly on ants and termites. So this makes them very important for the ecosystem it lives in terms of regulating the ants and termites populations. And uh, there are eight species of pangolin in the world, uh, four in Asia and four in Africa. All the four Africa species are classified as uh, vulnerable by IOC and Red List, and the Chinese pangolin and the Sunda pangolin are classified as um, critically endangered, while the India pangolin and the Philippine pangolin are endangered. So all eight species are not doing very well in general, and the main threat to their population is uh, poaching and illegal trade. So uh, uh, some data from Animiticus, uh, they use traffic data from 2011 to 2013. Uh, they estimated that around 100,000 to 200,000 penguins were killed within these three years and due to the demand from the international trafficking. And um, another piece of information from traffic report uh, using seizure data from 2010 to 2015 um, that 
summarizing the traffic routes, we can see that a lot is happening intercontinental between Africa, Europe, uh, North America, and also a Asia, and a lot is also happening within Asia. Another piece of information from this map is that uh, China is a really a hotspot on this map. Uh, it serves as a den end destination for a lot of the trading routes and also uh, transit uh, to other routes as well. So this is part of the reason why I focus my research mainly in China because it's quite important in this trade network. And um, more, a bit more about China, we all know it where it is. It's a very huge country um, geographically and also population, human population wise. It, it also has very unique biodiversity, uh, a lot of endemic species and um, uh, Chinese pangolin has its major distributions within China, uh, south of the Yanti River. And um, uh, the population is uh, also not very clear. And the pangolin market in China is mainly can be divided into three types. Uh, the first one is the pangolin scales, the demand on pangolin scales, mainly from the traditional Chinese medicine. And the, the second market is for the meat, uh, mainly used as a luxury dish in the world meat market. And then thirdly is the ornamental market, uh, which demands um, pangolin uh, claws or leathers or skin or whole skin. Uh, or sometimes uh, carve off the whole scales. So um, if you look at this trade network, this is really simplified yet still quite messy pangolin trade network uh, in China. Um, I think there are two ways to look into this trade. Firstly, we can see it as three layers, um, the hunters, the trader and sellers, and the end consumers. Um, there are two types of hunters uh, the, for the local ones because um, for many folks trading in China, so not really much on the international trade. Uh, the local hunters, they are local opportunistic hunters and the local professional hunters. I will explain in more detail in later. And for the traders and sellers, as I said before, because there are mainly three types of demand. So there are three types of markets, well, the ornaments, the traditional Chinese medicine and the wild meat. And um, correspondingly, three types of consumers, the ones who buy ornaments, the ones, uh, the ones who consume scales for medical use, and the ones who consume the meat. And the other way to look into this trade network is by the level of knowledge or um, the understanding that people have towards their own behavior uh, and the consequence of it. So um, for people who are being circled by red colors on this map, um, they are the ones that have a quite clear understanding of their own behavior. So they know that, for example, the professional hunters, they know hunting pangolin is illegal and they know the potential consequence if they get arrested, uh, so um, the sentencing. And however, in the contrast, for the people being circled in green colors, um, they probably do not know uh, their connect their the connection between their behavior with the animal pangolin, or they probably do not know that their behavior is illegal, or even if they know that it's not allowed, they may not perceive as a very severe uh, violation of the law. So the, the thing, the consequence is very minimal or not really there. Um, so I will go through each layer um, and then uh, each group in a brief way so that we have an understanding of the general picture. So firstly, the hunters, uh, as I said, there are two groups. To understand their attitude and their behavior, I interviewed uh, villagers living around the forest reserves in Hainan Island, uh, which is the island you can see on the map there. And uh, these are the uh, villagers living really ne right next to the forest reserves and right next to the mountains, where pangolin population may still remain. Um, the, these two pictures show the kind of environment that they live in. So it's really in their backyard and they have the access to the wildlife resource if they want to. And um, uh, so I conducted this in interview in these villages and while I was doing that, I see some uh, conservation or environment protection information floating around in the village. For example, the one on the um, right, uh, left here is a poster for conserving the Hainan Gibbon, which is the um, most endangered 
uh, primate species in the world, only like 25 of them left on this one single island. And uh, on the right here, we can see a poster uh, saying uh, stop illegal killing or hunting of wild uh, wildlife um, and with uh, numerous protected species being listed on this poster. It was very nice and uh, while I was interviewing the people, asking their attitude and their behavior about hunting, uh, and it's quite sensitive, so a lot of them say, oh, it's not allowed to go into the mountain anymore because now there's a reserve being set up and uh, it's illegal to hunt. So it's, it's quite good. It shows people have awareness that this behavior is illegal and it's not allowed anymore. But on the other hand, I also receive information such as, oh, pangolin is under second class protection, so it's not as precious as panda. And the underlying message is, if you had one, it's not such a big deal because it's just under second class protection, which is true. Um, um, and uh, there are also people saying, oh, a pangolin running to steal, so he had it. Um, so from these messages in general, I think there are, um, it shows, firstly, there is a gap between people's awareness and their attitude and behavior. So they know it's not allowed and they know it's protected, but uh, on the other hand, they don't think it's a big deal and then they still do it. And secondly, I think there is a misunderstanding uh, about the concept of protected animal and protected area that people may think the protected animal is only protected within a frame, within the protected area frame. That, um, uh, for example, the one who said pangolin run into the field. So if the protected animal run onto people's property on their land, they may think it's not protected animal and belong to their um, uh, sort of property. Um, so it suggests that maybe uh, besides raising people's conservation awareness, we should address on these gaps and misunderstandings for more effective protection. And on the other hand, the professional hunters, they are on a totally different scale because they rely on hunting for livelihood, unlike the optimist hunters who are most probably just like farmers or workers, uh, have their own livelihood. Professional hunters rely on hunting, full-time hunting for livelihood and pangolin is included in their prey spectrum. And uh, there is really nothing special about pangolin besides it's a relatively expensive prey. And from my interview, I found that the hunters on this island, they form a close network um, to share their information about their prey, about the price on the market, uh, where to sell it, and the consumers, uh, customers, etc. And um, so they, they, they have a very effective way, efficient way in sharing the, such information. And these uh, professional hunters, they spend most of their time within in the forest without coming out so they're very familiar with the forest landscape and uh, mm, through my interview i also found some of the hunters may have a quite close relationship between uh, with the government officials uh, which suggests that uh, corruption might be a problem when trying to tackling this group and all these um, factors contribute to the uh, scenario described by the forest police as catching them is very difficult uh, because they're very familiar with the forest landscape, so when they hear the forest rangers or forest police approach, um, they run away very fast, and uh, catching them is quite difficult. And uh, that's new techniques such as, for example, training uh, dogs to trace down these hunters, or anti-corruption actions um, might be required to more effectively tackle these. And the second layer of the trade is the traders and sellers. Um, this may involve layers of mid months and then the uh, end market where it's being sold to the consumers. And uh, because the mid months are really hard to target because uh, they are not a specific group that I can approach and interview. So um, I didn't get a lot of information on this. Um, but I did try to interview these different uh, markets and markets. So I conducted interviews in the two provinces, the Henan province, and again on the Hainan island, uh, interviewing traditional Chinese medicine doctors and uh, pharmaceutical shops, and also restaurants to try to understand the uh, concepts of the uh, well meat market and also the traditional Chinese medicine market. I also conducted online search for online ornamental shops 
that might be selling pangolin uh, products. Um, so what I found is that um, when I try to interview the wild meat market, I use the restaurant owner. Uh, they're very cautious about this. Uh, none of them, of course, admit that they sell pangolin meat, which might be true, um, because those are the ones who accept the interview in the first place. And um, they, uh, uh, they, they're very cautious about this illegal trade. And uh, even the legal ones, for example, when they, they're talking about farmed animals, they don't talk about now, they talk about previously they sold it, but, or other people who they know they're selling it, uh, but only previously. And they're also talking about inspections uh, from the forest police. Um, random inspections and they talk about people being arrested because they're selling illegal products. So there is a very high awareness about this uh, illegal issue and then people are acting at it. So if, for example, uh, these people, they say they don't sell it anymore and um, uh, they know people who sold it before don't sell it now, otherwise they're being arrested. And for the online ornamental shops, uh, similar things happen. So uh, I found that uh, the platforms that I searched, uh, they ban certain keywords. For example, if I try to search pangolin, um, it, it either shows no result in one platform and the other platform, uh, it shows some like non-related uh, products, for example, uh, pangolin-shaped uh, backpacks, etc. So there are some actions being taken. Uh, whether it's effective or not is another story because I still find people who consume pangolin meat and people who sell pangolin meat. And also for the online ornament shops, I found shops are selling these uh, potential pangolin products. But we can see some actions being taken. Um, but for the traditional Chinese medicine market or the TCM market, I think it's a completely other story because firstly, um, this market, part of it is still legal, which I will talk a bit more later on. Uh, so there is a mix between legal trade and illegal trade, which makes enforcement uh, very difficult. And also, uh, I, I see that there is very little action directly targeting this market, uh, especially on the illegal bit. <clears throat> and uh, I will talk a bit more later on. Um, so for the last layer, <clears throat> for the consumers, <clears throat> Sorry. There are, um, as I said, because there are mainly three types of demands, so three types of consumers, uh, but I uh, assume that all the public, the general public, are potential consumers. So I conduct basically public service in these two uh, provinces. And um, while I was uh, conducting the interview, I also found that um, there are already quite a lot of pangolin campaigns. Uh, for the conservation purpose, for example, this one connected by Well Aid and TNC, uh, invite the famous celebrity Jackie Chan uh, for to campaign for um, pangolin conservation. And the slogan here says, "Protecting pangolin only needs one action, which is to refuse illegal pangolin products." And these type of campaigns are quite useful in terms of raising people's conservation awareness. Uh, so one of the questions in my questionnaire is. What's the pangolin population status in China, do you think? And um, from these response, we can see that more than 70% of the interviewee in both provinces think that pangolin population in China is uh, threatened to a certain degree. I grouped uh, critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable into like people know that it's being threatened because I think uh, differentiating these three categories is kind of blurry for public understanding. Um, so most of people know that pangolin population is not doing well and uh, they need protection. Uh, but again, I see there is a gap between people's awareness and their attitude. So in this question, I ask, um, do you support to trade pangolin products as the following commodity? Um, the, the three commodities being medicine, food, and ornaments. Uh, as you can see on the diagram here, that is, there is a quite uh, obvious difference between people's attitude towards trade pangolin products as medicine versus food and ornaments. That more than 37% of the interviewees in Henan province support trade pangolin products as medicine. And the same pattern repeated in Hainan province. Again, that more than 25% of the interviewees support to trade pangolin products as medicine. And this high supportiveness 
It's not because they don't know that pandemic needs protection, because as the previous slide suggests, that most of people do know that it's being threatened. And um, um, but this high supportiveness is because people think the trade is legal. So this trade decision diagram uh, shows that um, it's an analysis of Henan province, but it's kind of same for the Hainan province. So I only put one here. That people who think the trade is legal, who think that trade primary products as medicine is legal, more than 73% of, the, of them support it. And who think it's illegal, more than 90% of them not supporting it. And the rest is kind of don't know. Um, so it, it shows that really uh, the guarantee is the only thing that concerns uh, by people, whether in terms of whether it's supported or not, uh, but not the conservation awareness. So I think we need to do a little bit more than raising just raising people's conservation awareness, but really targeting at what they really care and what really influences their attitude and that hopefully their behavior. Um, so in the second session, I will talk a bit more about the traditional Chinese medicine market because I think it's quite unique. As we can see here, that um, uh, in the end, uh, in the sellers and trade trader session, uh, only the TCM market is being circled by green color. Because from my interview, I actually found that people don't have much understanding about the legality of their behavior, and. Um, um, but firstly, a little bit background on traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, uh, for people who don't know about it. Uh, I'm not an expert in this, so I just copy a definition from Wikipedia. So it's a, TCM is a style of traditional medicine built on the foundation of more than 2,500 years of Chinese medical practice. So it has a really long history and is still being widely applied nowadays. Um, it's part of the mainstream healthcare system right now in China. Uh, what I mean by mainstream healthcare is that if you're sick and if you go to a public hospital, so funded, those funded by government, you can get traditional Chinese medicine treatment. And if you have a health insurance, that will be included into the health insurance as well. So it's a, it, it's a very common thing in China and people don't really differentiate uh, TCM versus vet medicine. A lot of cases, uh, they are being prescribed at the same time even. Um, and pangolin scales is also being used in TCM for a long time, for at least 1,500 years. And it's being used to trace a wide range of symptoms of disease, from uh, stimulating lactation to liver disease, certain types of tumor, to some bone injury, et cetera. And so it, it's, a, it's a very, so it's a quite common thing. It's not a new thing that being newly uh, promoted. Well, there are some promotion recently, probably because it's high price, um, but practicing of using time and scale can be traced back to uh, uh, quite long ago. And uh, for the, from, from the legislation level, internationally, we have scientists listing all eight pangolin species in Geo Appendix 1. So that bans all international commercial trade. And within China, pangolin is listed as the second class national protected animal. Uh, well, this is just for Chinese pangolin, but uh, the, for the, um, but uh, for other species, if they are being, for example, seized in China, they will receive the same level of protection as Chinese pangolin. So it's equivalent to the second class national protected animal. Um, so that bans um, <clears throat> unpermitted hunting or trading of pangolins within China. And um, uh, but as I said before, there is still a legal market to trade pangolin scales. Um, so that requires certificates uh, for the trade. Uh, that the certificate is the one that you see on the bottom right here. Uh, the sticker with the deer head on is the, the certificate to trade pangolin scales for medical use. And uh, also for farm of pangolins, is, that requires special certificates as well. And this legal market, um, although we have pangolin farms, but uh, uh, there's no evidence suggesting consume, con commercial scale farming has been successful in China. So the legal, only legal source supporting this um, pangolin scale market is from a quota assigned by the National Forestry Bureau or State Forestry Administration every year to each provinces. And uh, it's said that these, 
quota is from the uh, historical stockpiles uh, that's being accumulated from 1960 onwards. So, and uh, this quota allows certain hospitals and also pharmaceutical companies to manufacture and sell um, medicine, the contained pangolin scales or uh, pangolin scale directly as a medicine. And the picture on the bottom left here is an annual quota assigned. Uh, so it's a quota for, for 2014 to 2015. And um, if we look at this quota uh, on a local scale, so because I conduct my survey in Henan province and Hainan province, um, for Henan province, the annual quota is um, vary a lot. And uh, uh, the minimum is like 30 kilograms per year to the maximum 800 kilograms per year. And uh, there's no quota assigned for Hainan province, probably because it's too small or being grouped into other provinces, uh, we don't know. Um, but we only have the quota information for Henan province. And this is from the legislation level of what should happen. Um, but if we look at what's really happening on the ground, so I interviewed hospitals in both provinces and in Henan province, I interviewed in total 27 uh, hospitals and uh, 22 of them sell pangolin scales. And in total, these 22 hospitals sold more than 4,000 kilograms of pangolin scale, raw pangolin scale in one year. And so we can see that the quota is really nothing comparable to this um, actual demand. And this is only from the 22 hospitals that I surveyed in two cities in one province in China. And um, if we convert it into a more sort of um, understandable figures uh, using these rough um, ratio, one kilogram of processed pangolin scale roughly comes from three kilograms of uh, raw pangolin scale and equivalent to roughly six pangolins. So in total, these 22 hospitals would demand more than 8,000 pangolins in one year. And so it, it's a really, really huge demand, but we can see that it's, it's not all legal and not from the figure of the demand, but um, also from the permit. As I said, um, if you want to sell pangolin scales, you need a special permit from the government. And I, in total, in these two provinces, I interviewed 40 hospitals in total, and 26 of them sell pandemic scales. And among the 26, actually 17 of them are selling it illegally without the permit. But they are quite open about it. When I interview, they talk about uh, their demands, their annual demands, their, uh, what they use for, and uh, where they get it from, et cetera. So they're quite open to it, and um, because they don't know it's illegal. And the same thing happens with the pharmaceutical shops. So in total, in these two provinces, I interviewed 134 pharmaceutical shops, and 90 of them sell uh, traditional Chinese medicine. So not all of them sell traditional Chinese medicine, 90 of them sell it. And among the 90, um, 40, 46 of them actually sell pangolin scales. And, um, it, it's all illegal because the permit is the only issue to hospitals. And so none of these pharmaceutical shops should sell pangolin scale. But again, uh, more than half of them who sell T, uh, TCM actually sell pangolin scale illegally. So uh, to summarize a bit about the traditional trans medicine market, the demand is really huge and there's no system of supply because the only supply, the only legal supply should come from the quota. And uh, as we can see that it's neither enough nor can sustain long term because the quota is going to run off someday. And the legislation is also very weak because um, from the quota, although we know it's being issued to each province, so the provincial level, but uh, what happens beyond the provincial level, how the quota is being assigned to hospitals or is being assigned to pharmaceutical company, uh, we don't know. And um, um, there is also very little, if any, enforcement that I can see, uh, especially targeting those uh, hospitals, because of them are seen quite um, open about the questions I ask. And when I ask about, uh, do you know any related uh, regulations or policies about pangolin scale uh, use or pangolin scale sale, 
um, none of them mentioned the quota or none of them mentioned that there is a limit of amount of pangolin scale they can use. Well, if the actual demand is far below the quota being assigned by the Forestry Bureau, then that makes sense that there is no limit that uh, uh, the doctors will know. But then from my interview, I see, I see that uh, the actual file is far beyond uh, the quota being assigned. Uh, so, there, there, so the demand is, is way over it. So it, it would make sense to have upper limit so that the doctors will know uh, what's the maximum amount of scale they can prescribe per year would make sense in that kind of situation. But however, none of them actually mentioned there is such thing. Um, most of the, the hospitals say it just imports the stock uh, when they run off and uh, as much as they need it. So it's definitely not a very strong enforcement in that level. And uh, again, the, 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 the people who participate in this trade, the doctors, the practitioners, they don't really know about pangolin related policies. They don't know their behavior is illegal and they don't know the source is illegal. So, and also um, because of this kind of very um, blurry understanding of the policies in general, the public shows a very high support towards the trade because they think it's legal, uh, although uh, the market is largely illegal. So um, to summarize my presentation overall, I think um, firstly targeting the professional hunters and traders uh, because they, they quite understand their own behavior, they know it's illegal and uh, uh, they know the potential punishment if they get arrested. So information campaigns might not be a very efficient way targeting this and probably more uh, uh, law enforcement and stronger active actions uh, might be the way to talk, tackling this. And for the illegal traditional Chinese medicine market, um, I think we definitely need more active actions and more and stronger enforcement because the illegal trade is being just happening quite openly and everyone accepts it as a, a legal thing. And uh, finally, um, I want to say that I definitely want more social science for effective conservation because I get all these information through interviews and through understanding people what do they know and I think it's quite useful in terms of in terms of suggesting uh, what might what might be what should be done in future. Um, so um, for acknowledgement, I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Nigel Little Williams and Dr. Simon Terry for their support and guidance and special thanks to Dr. Dan Shalinder uh, for his gentle help on my project overall and thanks to all the volunteers and organizations that helped me to conduct the interview. And uh, Thanks for listening. Any questions? That's great. Thanks, Ifu. Um, very interesting uh, set of observations and insights. Um, just to um, welcome questions from the floor, I can't see raised hands at this point, but um, I guess one from me to kick us off. So the, the status of this research at the moment, if you could clarify, um, this is uh, sort of some preliminary insights from your field research for your for your PhD, and uh, yes. it's not published at this point, is that right? Uh, no, 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 it's not. Yeah, I should maybe uh, point, <laughs> yeah, say that. Uh, yeah, it's not published yet. So uh, yeah, please don't share it. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. No, no worries. Um, yeah. So I see Steve has uh, raised hand. Uh, go ahead, Steve, with your question. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Um, thanks for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I just, my question is, do you think a blanket ban on all pangolin trade uh, is the answer here? Or do you support a more um, complex approach? Um, I, I, I personally, I do think that uh, overall ban is definitely needed, but then how we approach to this ban, I think we need more diverse approach, especially I think we need to get uh, support from the traditional Chinese medicine community. They have to understand why we need this ban, and especially on their standpoint, why they need this ban, because it's not 
just for because they uh, I mean I talked to a lot of PCM doctors and one of them I try to sort of we're, we're friends now so we kind of chat a lot and I try to sort of see what kind of reason can he accept as the reason to have the ban and so I said okay um, the panel is going to make things if we continue like this and uh, would you think it's uh, enough reason to support to, to, to have this ban and he thinks not really <laughs> And <laughs> because um, he think it's just um, for pay because he's a doctor and part of uh, as part of his identities, his duty is to prescribe the best medicine uh, he can to the patients. And if pangolin is available uh, and it's needed by the patients, he think if he thinks it's needed, then he will prescribe it. And uh, even if that, uh, then I say, okay, then uh, what about future patients? Because it's not sustainable. So we're going to stop somewhere and um, better than later, because later, if the population goes extinct, then uh, there, there's no hope uh, for future use. And uh, he said, uh, and that's also not a very bad reason, <laughs> because um, in terms of uh, rather than worrying uh, patients in future, um, the patients said, right in front of me uh, develop more care or uh, it's more of my attention and my duty is just to prescribe the best medicine so in future if pangolin extinct or it's not available anymore i what, what i do is still prescribe the best medicine i can so um but then i i kind of change an attitude uh, change an angle say okay but now uh, the illegal trade is really the dominant uh dominating the market and uh, uh, being illegal doesn't uh, it doesn't only mean that the trade the source is from like abroad is illegal, but also there's no control of the quality of the, the the scales and there's a lot of fake scales going um being sold and uh, a lot of chemicals being added into the scales uh, to add up some weight and that uh, that's what also what I found through my survey. Um, and so there. So if you prescribe pangolin scale to your patients, uh, if you can't guarantee that they are really getting the the the, the real scales and uh, they, if there's a potential health threat to them to get the fake ones, then maybe is that a reason to for you to consider? And he said, yeah, that might be something that I need to pay attention in future. And he said, oh, I may need to like check the medicine. That my patients get for every prescription. So, um, yeah. So, sorry, it, that's a bit long, but <laughs> um, so yes, I think definitely um, a trade ban is needed because there is just no sustainable supply towards this market. So we have to stop sometime. And uh, but to get this trade ban, uh, my hope is that we can get support from the traditional Chinese medicine community because they are the ones. Who are using it and who are prescribing it and being affected by this policy. So uh, their understanding and their support would um, be very helpful. Thanks, Afi. If I can um, open it up to make sure that we cover as many uh, questions as possible. So, uh, Jeremy, you're next in the queue. Uh, Gavin and Wanda, you're, you're noted. Thank you. Hi, Gail. It's Sarah, actually. Um, thank you. For, that was a really fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, two small questions, please. Yeah. The first is, did you take your findings to the provisional, sorry, the provincial court, um, provincial government, to talk about the need for law enforcement? That was my first question. And then the second was, did you also talk to the traditional Chinese Medicine Association to talk about whether there were alternatives in which could be Ah, yeah, so um, for the first questions, I, I haven't done that yet. Um, well, I tried, I interviewed uh, provincial forestry bureaus, and uh, but that was uh, during my interview, so I wasn't really suggesting anything. Um, and for the law enforcement aspect, because really the, the, the legal market for the traditional Chinese medicine bit, um, the legal market and the illegal bit is really mixed up and um, uh, even the hospitals with legal permit uh, the source of their pangolin scale is probably illegal because um, 
I, I can't see the stickers on a lot of their products. Um, so um, I would definitely like to talk to the, the government uh, about these suggestions. I haven't done so yet uh, because I haven't really found the access to talk to them yet. And to, in terms of talking to the traditional Chinese medicine communities, um, the association, I haven't talked to them yet. Uh, but while I was interviewing the doctors in these hospitals, I asked for if there is any possible substitutes. And uh, actually 80% of them think it's possible. Uh, and also it's a way of asking the question. If you ask them directly if the if pumpkin scale is substitutable, uh, most of them would say no. Uh, because they think it's unique and uh, nothing can substitute something else like equivalently. But then if you ask them, then what what if you have no pandemic scales to use? Uh, would they mean that certain diseases or certain symptoms have no cure or no prescription? And they would say, um, no, not really. And we have like other prescriptions that doesn't contain pandemic scale. So 80% um, of the doctors I interviewed expressed that kind of um, attitude. Um, so, so I, I think it's definitely possible. Thanks, um, Ifu. So over to Gavin next, and then Wanda. Hi, yes. Um, I have a question, interesting results. I have a question actually on your interview approach with the hunters. Yes. How do you approach the hunters in basically for them revealing such um, information during the interviews, despite you know knowing that the pangolin is an animal? Yeah? The area, and on top of that, is, I find it interesting because when you interview with the with the traders, they're a bit cautious in revealing the information. So, mm -hmm. how do you make the hunters comfortable in revealing such information? Um, yeah, because um, for the hunters, um, I navigate to them through uh, networks, so layers of uh, friends, and friends, friends, and that kind of thing. So before I interview them, well, when they accept the interview, it means that they have, um, they, they trust me. Uh, well, they trust their friends who introduced me. Um, so that's why I can interview them. Uh, well, on the other hand, uh, for the restaurant, because I couldn't sort of spend such a long time for, it, uh, for a single restaurant. So uh, I just like walk into a restaurant and try to talk to their manager and the restaurant owners. So in that way, it's really hard to gain their trust um, in the first place because they don't know me and uh, uh, they sort of, yeah, so that's why they're very cautious about it. Well, on the other hand, when I interview the hunters, I know they're hunters and uh, they know, I know they're hunters. <laughs> um, they can tell me a lot of information that is um, quite sensitive. Okay, great. Thank you. Over to Wanda. Uh, Wanda, can you hear us okay? I think you're still muted. <clears throat> I think this is better. Yeah, Hello. that's great. Thank you. I can hear you loud and clear now. I thought you were unmuting me, but I had to do it myself. Yes. So. Great, thank you for the for the presentation. So, first a question on this, or makes you a recommendation. Uh, I'm work for Globescan, and we've done several studies on pangolins for USAID, and also mm -hmm. for the Zoological Society of, of London. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay. My supervisor Sam survey is from Zaza. Okay, good. Because actually, I believe based on on what you just told us today in the webinar, and also on the research which we conducted in China and now also in Vietnam, mm -hmm. it will be very difficult to convince TCM users, but definitely practitioners, that pangolin scales uh, should not be used because of conservation reasons. Because at the end of the day, their patients are more important than the pangolins, right? And that's yeah. just that too. I think yeah. the only two opportunities we have, it's a strong legal penalties, well that's a, it, that will take a long time, mm -hmm. or a good substitution. And actually that was a question earlier asked. Mm -hmm. did you, spend some, you, you sp mentioned something about substitution. Mm -hmm. but in, in my view that, that is maybe the best way or the only possible way forward to convince practitioners and TCM users that we have a, a better solution on pangolin scales. Did mm -hmm. you 
you mentioned it before, but can you dig a bit deeper into that, or do you have an opinion how we could possibly do that? Um, yes, um, but um, I think it it shouldn't be us who um, say they should use this as substitute, but more to sort of leave them to their own for the TCM communities for them to discuss what should be used as substitute. Um, and I, I suspect it won't be a single thing. So it's it's probably not going to be like a one-to-one -one solution. As I said before, um, if you ask them directly, is there anything to substitute Pangolin scale, they will say no. Um, because uh, if you ask them there's no Pangolin scale to use, what they say as substitute is a whole other prescription. Um, so it's, it's not that something that substitute Pangolin scale alone, but a prescription to substitute a prescription, the whole set of medicine. Um, and uh, during my interview, yeah, because I asked about these substitute questions, so they, they mentioned a long list of things that they might use if there is no Pangolin scale. Um, pig nails is one popular one, and then, uh, a cow herb, I think, uh, that's the English name, and um, um, yeah, and a, a long list of uh, things. So um, definitely we need to let them know that the substitute is definitely needed because uh, having the scale is going to run out quite soon. Um, so think think about or consider, try to practice what could be used as substitute. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite important. Um, but I think it's, it doesn't really sort of uh, compromise the, the approach of the legal uh, legal uh, ban that uh, um, to persuade them that to stop use it uh, and to support the, the trade ban. I hope I answered the question. Yes, it does. And I agree, of course, it should be definitely a combination of a legal ban and uh, yes. trying to convince these, these people that to find a, a substitute because otherwise they won't, they won't need to do it anyway and, and rather sooner yes. than later. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Wanda and Ifu. So um, there's a, a question in the comment box from from Noi from uh, WCS Indonesia. I don't know um, okay. uh, if if you can see that, but um, yeah. the short question is: she's wondering about the the trade chain presented. Um, is there any kind of work ongoing from your research uh, that you're aware of? I guess in relation mm -hmm. to the actors. Um, and behaviors involved in other aspects of, of the trade route. Mm -hmm. um, um, are you able to speak to that? Yes, uh, yes, I, I did sort of focus on each single uh, layer of the trade, uh, but because of this presentation, I just like provide a brief overview of it. Um, and, um, um, but it's, it's quite hard to identify of the actors or the, the, the motivation behind the behavior, uh, especially for the, um, the hunters aspect and also um, the trade, um, the market besides the TCM. Because of the TCM, the, the, the motivation is quite simple. It's either because it's a quite expensive medicine or because it's effective in medical value. Um, so yes, uh, I tried to, but um, I didn't get much information. Not a short answer, but uh, um, analysis is still going on in for my PhD. So I hope uh, there will be more results later on. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so any further questions from audience members? Hi. Hi, hello. Hi, is that Kyo? Uh, yes, it's me. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. have, I have a question. If you, do, you, um, do you have any thought about whether a uh, consumer of angry meat could be other types of, of rare meat or what, are, what might be like alternatives that, that are out there? Um, I didn't, in my questionnaire, I didn't ask alternative for pangolin meat. Uh, I asked for their why uh, why they think why the interviewee thinks other people are having pangolin meat and i think there are generally 
three uh, categories. The first one is for the uh, for the price, and so it's it's a quite expensive uh, commodity and it's quite rare. And uh, that consuming that kind of luxury dish uh, shows their status or um, their wealth. And um, so for these for these types, um, I think pangolin scale, um, sorry, pangolin meat is nothing special compared to other expensive meat like uh, lobster or um, expensive crabs or something like that. So that might be potential um, substitute for this group, but I didn't ask for potential substitutes. Um, and the second category is um, the ones that uh, who think pangolin meat has health benefits. Um, so for these groups, pangolin meat is quite special. It's not something that can be substituted equivalently by something else because pangolin meat provides a certain uh, health benefit that uh, is unique. Um, so in this case, I'm not sure if they will have a substitute or uh, for their motivation. And the third group is the ones that just like to consume wild uh, meat. So I, I, it's not because it's expensive or because it's pangolin, but because it's wild and um, they like the flavor or they like, um, um, yeah, so it, it isn't new, and it's natural and uh, not uh, farmed or not processed. So, yeah, I, um, I think there are these three general groups of um, consumption motivations and uh, there are different, there might be different substitutes for um, different motivations. Okay, thanks. If we, I've got one more question coming in. Uh, this time I do believe from Jeremy, not Sarah. Um, over to you, Jeremy. It is actually Jeremy Eckel. Hello, thanks, um, Gail. And thank you very much for that great presentation. My question is, the two provinces in China which you selected for your work, yeah. did you pick on those because you knew that it was quite a um, high proportion of use of pangolin, or was it random in a sense? And so my question really is, are there parts of China where this is known to be a much bigger problem than others, or is it pretty much ubiquitous that the, the levels of pangolin use in TCM that you saw would be replicated right across the country? Um, that's my question. Okay, yeah, thank you for your question. It's a very good one. Um, well, the reason why I picked these two provinces uh, for Henan province, the one in the middle, uh, because that's my hometown. <laughs> so I'm from that province and I have a lot of uh, ground connections networks available um, in that province. And because, I mean, for the, especially for the traditional Chinese medicine market, if you want to interview these hospitals, um, you can't just like walk in and uh, grab someone to ask a question. You have to sort of being introduced and um, they can accept your interview. So I picked that. I picked that province because I have this network available so that I can interview more hospitals. And um, Henan province is also the most populated uh, province in China, so it has a very high population overall. The cities that I interviewed, one of them have, um, I, I think, six, uh, sorry, wait, six million people, um, and another one has four million people. So it's a very, very like packed, uh, high population cities. And it's also in the center of China, um, where TCM is kind of, um, I wouldn't say originated from here, but uh, overall it's a very long history compared to other provinces, for example, uh, Yunnan and Hainan, which is the other province I interviewed. Um, more sort of minority groups um, uh, are living there and traditional Chinese medicine, which is more for the Han um, ethnic group uh, is not that popular, and uh, a lot of people in these sort of minority groups dominated province they use their own um, traditional medicines. For example, the the Li uh, ethnic group would use traditional Li medicine and traditional male medicine, etc. Um, so it's it, it's a quite sort of that's that's also part of the reason why I choose this province, high population and popular in traditional Chinese medicine. And for the Hainan province, um, 
I choose it primarily firstly because we know that the penguin population is still remaining uh, on this island and based on previous research from Helen, which is we have the same Sweetwater uh, Cemetery. And uh, based on her research, I know that um, these the, um, which reserves, which forest reserves might still have pangolin population remaining because I also want to interview hunters, right? And um, it would only make sense in places where pangolin population still remains, then there will be pangolin hunting going on. Um, and also uh, Hainan and Henan are quite uh, different provinces. They are both far apart geographically and also in terms of the local culture where uh, Henan is dominated by uh, Han ethnic group where uh, Hainan, although it's still dominated by Han, but uh, they have a lot of high proportion of uh, minority ethnic groups. Um, so I want to see whether these uh, would cause a difference in the market as well. So yeah, that's a, that's, that's a reason why I picked these two. And in terms of whether I can replicate across the nation, um, actually, I wouldn't think it's a very, I, I wouldn't have very much confidence in replicating exactly uh, across the nation. Um, but I think the idea of well, uh, the actual demand far exceeds the, the, the quota or the legal supply can provide is a general pattern across the nation. And um, uh, yeah, and also the widespread of uh, illegal markets. So that's my answer. Thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, to be fair, I think we might have to uh, draw it to a close there, sadly. Um, but uh, handing back over now to Kyo for wrap up. Thanks. Thank you, Gail, and thank you, um, Gifu, and everyone for joining us um, today. Uh, I just want to wrap up quickly. Um, yes, before we close, I just want to emphasize again that the views expressed are useful uh, personal ex um, opinion and that her research insights are provisional at this stage as contributing to her PhD at the University of Cambridge. And in terms of the webinar recording, again, we'll be posting the webinar recording as well as the presentation on shagewildlifeconsumers.org. That's the, please feel free to visit and then also share the link with your colleagues. And yeah, I will be um, sending a subscription link to our newsletter in the group chat. So if you haven't done so, but would like to receive news on upcoming webinars and other news on SPCC from us, please um, go to the link and subscribe and we'll be able to send you uh, emails. And, and yeah, great. Thank you very much everyone. And that's it from mine. And uh, we hope to see you again next time. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Thank you, Ifu. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.